I lost my mom when I was 16 years old. Mitt livs største utfordring var å miste moren min og mormoren min. I lost both my sister and my mother within a time span of six months, uh, both due to cancer. And the message will go home and take care of your younger one, because your mom is dead. Presten kom på døra og sa at mamma hadde død. Bestevenn min ble drept. Tøffeste i den jeg sonet, det var i 1999, datteren min døde. Jeg kom i bilulykke. Jeg hadde holdt den her på meg under hele begravelsen. Å miste et barn. Having my first child die. It was three days of pure hell on earth. The death of my brother was the loss of my, my younger brother, Rico. That was one of the toughest, toughest times of my life. Det var døgn før det skjedde, da sa hun «Nå dør jeg». I can feel it. I don't think it's going to be much longer. And he said to me, looked at me, and he's like, I can't do this anymore. It's like, when I'm asleep, I'm in pain. When I'm awake, I'm in pain, and I'm not getting better, and I just can't do it. Like, of course, I want my mother to be around, but I can see her pain, and I can feel my pain. And if her dying will give her peace, then that's something I can live with. Grief is an ordinary, normal human event. And there are four tasks, really, that you don't have to do linearly. That's why they're called tasks rather than stages. But all four of them need to be addressed, and people often get stuck in one or other of them. So the first one is actually called accepting the reality. Jeg gikk bare en hel sånn, nei, det har ikke skjedd, og de tar feil. You ain't dead. You ain't gone. I can't, I'm not gonna, I can't believe this is happening. Så det var bare, nei, det har ikke skjedd, sa jeg. Jo, det har skjedd. Så tok det litt tid før jeg skjønte det da. Nå aksepterte at ok, det har skjedd. You gotta go through that process of accepting it. Being um, just low as low can be and accepting that and thinking it's ok. This is just part of grief. So if you think about bereavement, often there's a lot of rituals that we go through at the beginning. So that, you know, working up towards a funeral. And those processes sometimes protect us from the reality, but then post-funeral, the reality can hit. Jeg måtte fikse alt med en begravelse og alt praktisk og sånn, opp i alt med følelser. Så jeg gikk med en gang inn i en sånn veldig sånn jobbegreie da. Well, obviously the first week when you're very busy with the funeral and everything, there's so much you um, have to organize. You're thinking about it. Like, oh, she's gone, but you're not realizing it yet. At jeg kjente at, oi, liksom at jeg på en måte tok det innover meg litt mer hva som faktisk hadde skjedd, og det var rett før kista skulle gå ned, da. Da løsna det. Da begynte jeg å grine. At his funeral, when they came out with the coffin, and he was putting it in the ground, I couldn't watch it go in the ground. I, I, I couldn't look. So I walked out the cemetery. I left. I walked away. I didn't, I couldn't look at it go down into the ground. I remember after I sat down, after we put the body, uh, sorry, the coffin down, it was, um, it came back to my seat at the church. And I do remember breaking down at that point. And I do remember crying hysterically. So it was first, after, a stund after the grave, that I began to take it in over me and know things on a little deeper level. But then it takes a little bit of time for that reality to sink in. So our minds are still working with the predictability of the fact that this person exists. So you often hear stories of, I thought I saw them in the street. Yeah, I thought I heard their voice. I think it's good for me now, because I still have days where I can actually take my phone physically and take my phone and call my phone. It's just like a millisecond in my brain, and they say, oh, this is what I'm going to tell you to mama. It's about 10 years ago. Og det er så rart at man ikke klarer å slå seg helt til ro med det. I think it breaks the rules of nature. I don't mean that formally, but there are expectations we have. And some of the expectations we have are things like sequence. You know, you're not supposed to die till you're a particular age. So these rules we have that are completely hidden in our heads until they're broken. And then we get a reaction. Det ble bare en sånn følelse av fortvilelse. Dyp fortvilelse, det her skulle ikke skjedd. 
man blir så sint och fortvilad. Det var ikke en alternativ att hun skulle dö. För det er mamma. Det er så rart men man tror aldrig att mamma ska dö. You know everything you believe in and that you believed in before they get shaken and you have to find your feet again. Quite a common one that's an invisible one is only bad things happen to bad people. This concept that life is fair whereas actually life is random. So people work really hard to try and make sense of something that has no sense. Like okay, why does this happen have to happen to me or us to my mom? If it breaks these hidden rules that we all have in our heads about how life is supposed to be, it's going to be tough. So the death of a, a child would potentially fall into that category, wouldn't it? I can't find a way to understand this. Yeah, because it, it is incomprehensible. So how do you come to accept something that you can't understand? The doctor told me, your child's not going to make it. Up until that point, I thought I had control. And that third day was the day that I realized, no matter if I was wealthy, poor, had money, no money, well educated, it didn't really matter. My child was going to die. And there's nothing that I could do about it. The second task, which is, the, I think, the most difficult task and the task that most people have tried to avoid at all costs, is feeling the pain. I did what many of us are very good at doing. I worked a lot. Da byttet jeg flyttet til Oslo, eh, levde livet og levde virkelig livet som jeg brukte som en sånn greie for å kope med det, tror jeg. jeg bare, og så kom liksom sorgprosessen sånn to-tre år etterpå. Da ble jeg avhengig av antidepressiva. Og det var mye på, på grunn av det at jeg ikke hadde presisert med de følelsene med benen i benen i benen i benen. And then there was that psychological part with me, which was locking myself up in a room. And that happened almost instantaneously. And at first it was an excuse, but then that moment turned to like hours and then days and then weeks. But I can tell looking back that I worked instead of grieving or instead of dealing with, with what had happened. So I had not the time to go around and be lei meg and in sorg, so I had to set up once a week, on a Sunday, lock myself in my room and do whatever I needed to to let it out. So whether it's cry, whether it's hit pillows, whether it's shout, whether it's scream, whether it's do whatever, press ups, whether it's whatever, or whether it was simple as journal. So I sat up over time, also five minutes for to grin all I could, also two minutes to come back, also to back to Irving, also the whole day. When I've worked with people and I've drawn out the tasks and I've asked them to tell me where they think they're stuck, I've yet to meet a client who isn't stuck in the feeling the pain. I think it stifled me in a way. I think it made me never really move on, uh, honestly. You know, I, I think I, I thought that I moved uh, on, but I can look again, looking back, I can see that I didn't. I just kept kept uh, threading in the same tracks over and over again. So you can't choose which emotions not to feel. You either feel or you don't. So often people will present it, I'm never, I don't even feel good feelings. Well, you won't, because the psychological effort that it takes to not feel, for instance, anger is phenomenal. I just didn't see anything positive. I felt so empty. I couldn't feel anything. I was so numb. And nothing's giving me joy. Um, I'm not happy. What does happiness even mean? And that it just went downhill from there. Because all the emotion just bubbled up and came. Because now they had the time. I had the time to think, to feel. And I didn't have time before. And you expect massive emotional responses. And if you're not getting emotion, massive emotional responses, then in a sense, they're not really feeling it. So we're not talking about crying, which is sort of leaking from the eyes. We're talking about gut-wrenching sobbing. So you're talking about the sadness, the anger, usually that you'd expect, you'd anticipate a lot of anger around grief. It's, I was angry. I was so angry. So many things came flooding back. I didn't know if I wanted to, to kill someone. I didn't know if I wanted to cry. Do you know what I mean? It was a very, very, very mixed feeling, you know? The pain is so much. I don't want to, I don't want to be here anymore. And um, I don't think I've ever felt that much pain in my life because you can't see a way out. I have grown more in 2020 than I have grown in my whole life. And it's very nice to be able to do that 
men vite det at dette går over. He just told me you have to feel the pain. You can't you have to stop running away from it and you just have to feel it. And every time you feel it, cry if you have to. Det rasna på den vonde klumpen jeg hadde i brystet. Men selvfølgelig det gikk over til å bli en annen tristhet, da, men den i brystet løsna. The third task is really starting to build new skills. So if I'm grieving the loss of the life I had before, I start gradually looking forward and thinking about, you know, I have to start taking on some of the things that maybe my partner used to take on. And then the fourth stage is where you actually have moved to a new life. However, that doesn't mean I'm sorted. You know, I've built my new life, jobs are good and off I go. You can get twanged back to any of these stages. But it can still hit me, you know. We're almost 20 years removed from all of this and it can still hit me. And, and sometimes I feel ashamed now because it's so long ago and, and you can talk about like, oh, well, you should get over it. Um, but you don't really. Det värste med en sån försinkad sorgprocess då går det att säga si det eller en sorgprocess är en sorgprocess men det som jag upplevde som försinkad sorgprocess var ju att alla andra var färdiga med det. Jag tänkte i alla fall att hvis jag snackar med dig nu så kommer de att tänka detta är ju länge sedan. Move on. Men det ska sägas att jag försökte heller aldrig att snacka med någon om det ordentligt. A classic um, experience with bereavement or with grief is anniversary effects. The first Christmas, the first birthday, the anniversary of the death, you can get twanged straight back into task two, feeling the pain. It's probably the first time you, you all have dinner together and then there's that one empty spot and then, you know, the moment you have to put stuff on the table, you take five plates, but you only need four. Those are the first moments where you're like, yeah, she's gone. And so in time, it's not that you stop feeling pain, it's that the intensity and the all-consuming nature of the pain reduces. Den jævlige følelsen du sitter med nå, den kommer til å minske litt etter litt, og du kan på en måte puste litt lettere etter hvert. I mean, you never completely heal from something like this, obviously, but it makes it easier to deal with it. Yeah. Hvis ting kjennes kjempetøft ut nå, så skal du vite at det blir bedre. Ok, kanskje det går to dager, kanskje det går... Kanskje det går Kanskje det går en uke, kanskje det går tre måneder, men det går over. Og det er trygt, for da tillater jeg meg selv å være sårbar. You know, I used to think it was the ugliest scar I have, but now it's the most beautiful thing. But it was like the process of accepting everything and learning about it. I think also people are really, really scared of emotions. So there's something then about how you help people start encountering those emotions in a safe way. Jeg ville tatt fem minutter til å ikke tenke over det, men bare føle på det. Ta den fem, fem minutter til å virkelig føle på den sorgen, for det er ikke skummelt, og man bør kunne føle at man kan gå dit. Kanskje ikke til hver, hver, hver tid, men man bør føle at man kan kunne gå og gå dit. Allow yourself to feel what you're feeling. Sometimes we can struggle with dealing with our emotions because one, we think we don't know what they are. Two, we haven't experienced them before. And three, it's kind of like we think that we have to do something with them. And it's like, sometimes you can just experience it. Very rarely does any one emotion last forever. It will have a period and then it will pass through you. So allow yourself to experience that. Let yourself feel the pain. There's so much beauty in it, even though you feel it's ugly and it's horrible. Let yourself feel the pain, the doubt, the insecurity. And let yourself be vulnerable. If we allow the emotions to come and do what they're naturally supposed to, and we stop thinking and blocking them, then the process will be horrendous. It's supposed to be, but it will also not be as drawn out. It'll be a healthier adjustment. If you're suppressing your grief like I did for a long time by working too hard or sometimes partying too hard or just running away, um, I would say to you, Try not to. <laughs> it sounds silly and easy, but and I know it's not, but it's better to just face it head on. And because if you don't, you're just prolonging it. I would say don't run away from it. Accept it. And, you know, grief is grief. And if you hide it, push it away, sweep it under the rug, it's only going to bite you in the ass somewhere along the line. If you feel that you're really long down, so tror jeg, eller jeg vet at det er enormt viktig å bare snakke om det til noen. 
Du trenger ikke å slippe hele historien hvis du synes det er vanskelig, men gi et lite drypp om at hei, jeg trenger deg for min egen del litt i rand akkurat nå. Jeg kan imagine, and I know what you're going through, but you need to talk to someone. You know, drugs won't help you. Alcohol won't help you. Keeping it in won't help you. The silence definitely won't help you. Once you share your feelings with your family and your friends, it will make you feel better. It will ease the, the weight of that brick that you have, that you carry inside of you. One thing I would advise you to do in general is journal. Write down how you're feeling, write down what you're feeling, why you're feeling that way. If it's anxiety, if you feel angry, if you are even happy for a moment, write everything down. Write down emotions as ugly and raw and painful as they are in that moment uh, really is uh, a great way to, to just vent. Not just to get them out of your system, but sometimes months later or e years later, um, it actually f almost feels good to go back and read them because you are going to feel much better when you read them back. And, and that's a good feeling. Take two pieces of paper. Write about the worst time in your life. Be honest with yourself. And just write it and take the other piece of paper and write about one of the most best times in your life, one of the most best feelings ever in your life. And put those few pieces of paper together and you'll be on your way. There's so much more to life than this black hole that you're in. There's so much more to life than this negative thoughts that you're having inside your head. You need to decide on moving forward and you need to accept that this is a situation, but you're able to have something way better, even though you can't see it right now. Make sure you enjoy your life. Do the things that give you joy, follow your passion. It will be very nice for you to know that the person you've lost would have liked you to do that even though they're not there along for the ride you you got to enjoy it don't lose yourself in the grief don't lose yourself completely in the grief you still have a life ahead of you so uh, and you're you're a much better person and a much better friend and a much better family member if you're closer to happy than if you're not <laughs>